of John tonight, and um, so this will complete our study of the Gospel of John, and the plan is to move into uh, the book of Ephesians and begin studying there. So if you want to read ahead or read the book of Ephesians to begin a study, that, uh, that's where we'll, we'll pick up, okay? All right, let's read starting in verse 15 of John chapter 21. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that the disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, we're going to kind of move through um, tonight because I know school started. We don't want to get too late here, so we're going to go through as best we can. Um, question one, if you look at your questions, what was Peter's occupation? He was a fisherman. Did his occupation change later in life? Yes. What did he become later in life? Fisher of men. We might call it an evangelist. Um, this is a process, and, and we kind of designate these two things. So he was a fisherman when Jesus found him and actually said the words to him, follow me, three years prior to this. He is still a fisherman, but his, what he is trying to catch is much different. His occupation changed. Now, did he still go fishing? Yes, he did. But his emphasis and his priority was not catching the fish that's underwater. His priority was evangelizing the gospel. When we become believers in Christ, followers of Him, our occupation changes as well. Because we become, if you want to think of it this way, we become employed by the Lord. And we are employed by Him to carry out a job or an occupation of sharing the gospel among the people here on earth. So our occupation changes. I would position to you, no matter what job that you have, you should be a follower of Christ first and a police officer second, or whatever it is. But first, we are a follower of Christ. So whenever someone asks you, you know, what do you do? The greatest answer you can give them is what you truly are. And that would be a follower of Christ. I hope a follower of Christ. Question two then, from what we know of Peter, what do you think was the most valuable lesson that he needed to learn? Trust and obey. Okay. What else? Probably patience, considering how impulsive he was. Patience. Okay. Think before you ask. Think before you ask. Yeah. With fish to catch. 
which fish to catch. I, uh, I wrote down humility. Uh, when you go back to three days, well, a few more days prior to this now, if you go back to before the, the crucifixion, and Peter was so extremely confident in himself, so bold that he said, I'll never deny you. And then he does, three times. And now Christ comes back here and he asks him three different occasions, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he gives him these answers of, you know, well then feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Um, Christ is taking him through and making him realize that in his brokenness, he is learning a valuable lesson. Do you think as believers we ever have to be broken of some things in order to learn some valuable lessons? I think he was taking him through this. He had to learn, Peter was going to be a leader in what we term the New Testament church. But before he could actually lead, he had to learn humility. The greatest leaders in life are those who have humility as a learned characteristic and, and part of who they are. In order for him to do that, and you've always heard, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Peter's confidence in himself was extremely large, and his fall was great. But in order to be a great leader, humility needs to be a part of, of who we are, and he needed to learn that lesson. So question three then, through the three questions that Jesus asked Peter, what is he communicating to Peter? Okay, he's going to go have, have to go out and be a shepherd. Okay. What else? Yeah, um, there is, a, um, there is a, a difference in the type of love he was asking about in those questions. Um, and Peter becomes somewhat frustrated because Christ doesn't accept his answer. But I think there's a greater even teaching here that he's doing with this. And when you look at, at what Christ walks him through, because he answers, Christ answers in three different ways. His first answer when, when Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you, there in verse 15, he says, feed my lambs. And then the second answer that you find in verse 16, he says, tend my sheep. And then the third answer that you find, again, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So you have feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. All of those are action items. They are not, Peter, you get to sit and let, tell everybody else what to do. Christ was teaching again along this line of the humility that he needed to learn. He was teaching him that as a servant, that he had to be out actively doing what Christ had called him to do, and that was to care for the flock. Notice feed them is to actually give them something that they need. Tend to them is to maintain. And then you have lamb and you have sheep. And even as we're older, we still need to be fed, right? So we find this as an action thing, speaking to the effects or speaking to the, um, the maturity of a believer as they would grow in their faith or as they become a believer. And so uh, Jesus is communicating this, that you've got to have an active role feeding and taking care of the sheep. When you look at, at um, again, Peter being a leader in this New Testament church, we talked about he would have to have humility. He also had to have a servant's heart, and that servant's heart should have come across as Jesus was asking him these questions. Will you tend my sheep? Will you feed my lambs? Will you feed my sheep? You get question four then, verse 19, Jesus tells Peter to follow him. Had he told Peter this before? Well, this is a test to see how well you listened a while ago. Three years prior. 
So three years prior, he had told him they were actually around the same lake when he made that uh, statement. Jesus walks by, Peter is fishing, and he says, come follow me. And now we find that he's saying this same statement to Peter again. Did it mean something different now than it did three years ago? Okay, he was fixing to leave. Do you think Peter had any idea what follow me meant three years prior? Come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Okay, what does that mean? But you sound interesting. I'm going to see what this is about. What about now? When Jesus says follow me, do you think it has a different meaning to Peter at this point than it did three years ago? And I would ask you this in your own life, because in those three years we saw, granted he wasn't perfect, but we saw tremendous growth in Peter. Would we agree with that? So I would ask you in your own life, the term follow me, does it mean something different to you now than it did three, four, five, ten years ago? Because as we grow in Christ and we mature in serving and following Him, that phrase, follow me, probably takes us much deeper, even every day or every year, however you want to measure it, than it did in previous years. If we get to a point where we say, you know, it means the same thing that it did, that might imply that, that we need to back up and maybe consider where our spiritual growth is. Because maybe somewhere along the way we've become content with where we are which is not what we need to do as a follower. So that term, follow me, meant much different to him at this point than it did in previous times. Now looking at question five, what was the message being communicated by Jesus to Peter in verse 22? So if you look at verse 22, Jesus says, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So you have... Peter finding out what type of death he's going to have um, probably wasn't real comforting, finding that out. And then Peter looks around and he sees John. And he says, well, what about him? Because if I'm going to be hung up, what about this guy? And Jesus gives him this answer. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? What do you think Jesus is communicating to him? Yeah. I put that on there. Hopefully that's somewhat obvious in our life, that this is Jesus saying, Peter, you need to worry about yourself, not about John or anyone else. But I also think that that's something that we need to remind ourselves of sometimes. Because sometimes we, we play the look around game. And we see where we are and we start looking at other people and we say, well, at least I'm not there. At least I'm not doing that. At least this is not in my life. And yet Christ would say the same thing to us that he said to Peter. Peter, don't worry about them. You worry about your own life and where you are. And so even when we think collectively as a church, we can't be looking at other churches and saying, well, at least we're doing this or not doing this. At least our people are doing this or not doing this. Because we have to look collectively as a church and say, these are the areas we're failing in. These are the areas we are doing well in. These are the areas we need some work in. We have to be honest with ourselves in our relationship, as a body, in our relationship with God. Just the same, and that, again, that begins with each one of us individually being honest with where we are with God. While not looking at someone else. Jesus then repeats that command at the end of verse 22 to follow him. Um, we know Jesus was going away back to his heavenly home soon. How were they to follow him if he was not there? Okay, the example that he set, what they would remember about his life. 
What about when they interacted something that Jesus had never, a situation that Jesus had never interacted with? So they don't really have an example necessarily of, of how to deal with that. So how would they follow him in that time? Yeah. Yeah, he left them the Holy Spirit. So when he says the term follow me, understand he's not just saying me, Christ, physically that you see right now, but he's saying follow, you could use the word us. He was saying follow us in terms of the Holy Spirit's coming, he's going to be my God. And if you remember, the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to come to remind us and remind them of all things that Christ had said. So this was a term of, okay, I am physically have been leading you. You've seen me with your eyes, but I'm going away. But you're not going to be left alone. The Holy Spirit's going to come, but it's going to be an internal leading that you're going to have. One of the challenges still today is for us to um, determine when that inner leading is being Holy Spirit spoken or where it's being, whether it's being spoken by us ourselves. And we have to work through that. And so one of the things we do is, is what Holly said a while ago. We, we look at the examples of Christ. So we go back to the Word and we say, okay, what I'm hearing to do, is this consistent with what we see in the Word? Because if it's not, then it's not from the Holy Spirit. If it is consistent with the Word, then there's a chance that it is. And then we have to kind of further evaluate it a little more. But Jesus was not leaving them alone. He was saying to continue to follow, and the Holy Spirit would be the guide that they would use. Now, in thinking about Peter and John's contributions to the beginnings of the Christian church, what we term the New Testament church, what are some things that each of these contributed? So what are some things we know about Peter if we look forward in his life from this moment in time we just read? So we're not looking back, we're looking forward. What are some things we know that Peter did in the New Testament church. He finally got it down about the wall. Peter was instrumental in figuring out that the Gentiles did not have to follow the law. Absolutely. He, uh, to put it another way, he figured out the Gentiles could be saved. <laughs> he was the first one that figured that out. Um, he struggled with it, but he finally figured it out. God kind of revealed that to him. And uh, then he kind of became a, a little bit of a spokesman in the church for that. So that's one of his contributions, we might say. What else? Who preached the first sermon recorded in the book of Acts? Peter. The day of Pentecost. First sermon that was recorded. Now, keep in mind, this is the guy that has... Failed Jesus on three times, if you want to call it that. Jesus had this interaction with him, and he's just said, well, great, what about John? Christ corrects him again, and then he ends up being the guy that preaches the first sermon. When we talk about redemption, we have to look at Peter's life and say, God is in the redemption process. He is in the redemption making, if we will just turn to him, which is what Peter did. Even though Peter was failing along the way, he was still turning to Christ. He was not turning away from Christ. He was maturing, though, and growing in that faith. Peter was also um, uh, part of the leadership of the Jerusalem church. Um, Peter was, I think we have talked about it several times, but Peter was a martyr in that. We might say that, that he was an example of faithfulness. Uh, by he, him staying true to being a believer in Christ, even though he was going to the death, um, or it cost him his life, so to speak. What about John? What did John do? He wrote Revelation. Yeah, he wrote Revelation. Mm-hmm. Yep, so he wrote the, the three letters, we might say. Of course, he wrote the gospel as well. But he was given the, the book of Revelation, the, the vision that he saw and, and um, um, the experience that he had. 
What else did John do? Baptized Jesus? No. It was a different John. That was John the Baptist. This was the Apostle John. I knew it was John the Baptist, but I didn't know if it was. Yeah. Yeah. Ann told you that, didn't she? That's what what I thought. (laughs) There are her (laughs) cheating. Can you think of anything else, John, done? He, okay, by the gospel, he, he laid out why he was the Son of God. Is that what, that's what you said, right? Okay, yep. Okay, so if we were to compare what we've just said about both guys to each other, which one would we say is the most valuable? Yeah, that's not an option, Daniel. <laughs> which one would we say was the most valuable? If we look at it, and I mean, just judging by the things that we listed, we probably would say Peter, the guy that preached the first sermon. Now, Revelation kind of makes it skewed a little bit just because it's a pretty important book. But when we look at outward appearance, we might say, you know, Peter tends to have done more, or we have more recorded that Peter did. You look throughout the book of Acts, and you see Peter. Peter was um, rescued from imprisonment as well. So we might look and say this. Now, what does Christ teach us, though, at the end? When Peter looks and says, what about John? What does Christ teach us? You worry about what you are to do in the kingdom. If we're not careful, we look around and we say, man, this individual is extremely important because we look at earthly accolades, we might say, and we start counting them up and we say, man, he played a much more important role. No. He played the role, assuming they were both believers, which Peter and John were, but I'm talking about someone today. As long as we're believers, we're playing the role in following. We're playing the role that God has for us to play. There is no one that is more important than the other, because if we're fulfilling what God has asked us to do, and if we're following, then we are equally important. And what God's will is for our life is what we should do. So we can't get distracted by Seems like I should be doing more when God's calling us to do this. Sometimes Does that make sense? Make it look like someone's doing more, more important because they're more precarious. Someone over here is quiet and doing lots of things behind the scenes that no one ever knows about. Absolutely. That's right. Brother Eddie and I think a lot alike. He's just better with his words than I am. <laughs> But I, I do that when I'm reading the Bible. I compare people I know or even my own children uh, to characters in the Bible and try to get to know personality. Because a lot of times you can understand their writings better if you understand their personality. So, you know, I mean, if anybody was going to end up in prison out of my kids for their faith, I'd say it's like a check. <laughs> and then, you know, John's a little more reserved, which I... I think of as Chandler, you know, and he talks when it's important to talk. Uh, and when he does, you listen, mm. you know. So that's just how I view the, the different personalities, so I agree with uh, Brother Eddie. But that's another thing, too, as we read and as we grow, and we're talking about discipleship and hiring other pastors, um, that's, all, that's all part of it, too. You know, I mean, we... We have different personalities. We have different talents and things that we're good at, things that we might not be so good at. Uh, and we have to understand when to let it go or when to let somebody else take control to get the job done appropriately. Yeah. And sometimes uh, we may have a desire to do X, whatever it is. But yet God knows we're not necessarily far enough along in our walk to do X. So he says, why don't you do Y right now? Because that's what I need you to do. And in a few years, you'll get to X. But just trust me on the timing. He's not calling us to do nothing. 
but he's calling us to do what he needs us to do at that time and what we are prepared to be able to do as well. There is no individual. We look around here, we look on Sunday morning, whatever time you want to look. There is no individual, if they are serving the Lord, there's no individual that's lesser important than anyone else. And it doesn't matter what role it is. And I also thought that, that here, well, it's hard to put a val these values on them because there's a lot of recording, a lot of stuff that probably wasn't recorded. Right. But John's long life took me out to live. Right, right. A lot, of years. a lot of things he done wasn't recorded. Right, yeah. All right, let's finish up with question eight. When we think of all that John has written in the gospel according to John, and we look at John chapter 20, verse 31. What does this recording of the gospel force us to do? So chapter 20, verse 31, I think I've read it several times over the last few weeks. John says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. What does this force us to do? No matter who we are, make a decision. Make a decision. <laughs> you either believe or you don't. And there is no in between with that. So when you take the Gospel of John out and you ask someone to read it, by the end of it, if they truly read it, study it, they're forced to make a decision at that point. And the question I would leave with you right before we pray is have you made the decision. The decision to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the only one that can redeem. He's the only one that can take away sin. Pray with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this time you've given us, Lord, your goodness to us, which includes your Son who came and gave His life. Lord, as we think about what we see in the life of Peter, Lord, help us to learn from, from his actions and, Lord, from the teaching that you have for him. And, Lord, let us, to, let us go forward from here with a yearning and a desire to see others know you and make this decision that John presents at the end. So, Lord, in all ways, let us be faithful to your calling for our life. But let us be striving to grow in our relationship with you so that others may know you by the example of the life that we live and by the words that we might speak. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.